pursuit of balance is a platform of learning. I travel the world, interview and speak to people who I truly admire. Every single one of them has overcome adversity with integrity. And they've emerged from that platform okay, to serve and help others with deep humility, compassion, and love. And today is no exception. Today, I'm going to be speaking to a Vedic scholar who advises organizations, you know, entrepreneurs, business leaders, even bodies like the United Nations. Okay. He's an author, he's a yogi, he was a movie director, many facets. But above all, he's one of the finest human beings I've had the pleasure of interacting with. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Please put your hands together and welcome His Holiness Bhakti Charaswani. <laughs> Maharaj, welcome to In Pursuit of Balance. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Maharaj, I know um, many of us have read your books, watched your videos, attended your talks, spoken to you, followed you for many, many years. And I'm sure that over this time, everyone feels like they know you, but I know we've not even scratched the surface of understanding the personality. And I, I pray that today, we get to just peel back one more layer uh, of your knowledge and understand you as a person and the depths of your knowledge. Okay. Marj, the, the topic for today is in pursuit of balance. And you speak very, very often about balance in terms of balancing the spiritual reality with material nature. Okay. Can you share a little bit of that? When we talk of balance, we naturally consider two aspects to balance with. In his speech, Mr. Pandey actually very wonderfully explained about the different types of balance that are needed in our day-to-day -day life. Like one balance is balancing our corporate life and private life. Balance between the haves and have-nots. And so I was very impressed with that point that you made about the rich give to the poor to uplift them, to create a sort of a balance. And, and I completely agree with you that you know if everybody thinks in that way, the world will be a different place today, especially the, if the nations take up that consideration. But as a spiritualist, <laughs> My consideration of balance is often between material and spiritual. We can see that two things are existing side by side in the world around us. Matter, inert matter. In this world, by nature, everything is actually inert. Matter is inert, dead matter, as we say. But at the same time, we see that we all, although we have a body made of matter, but these bodies are not functioning like matter. These bodies are conscious. These bodies are alive. What makes the bodies conscious, bodies alive, the presence of the soul. When somebody dies, although the body is lying here, we say he is gone. He passed away or she passed away. So who is that he or she that we are speaking about? 
Mm. And that is the soul that makes the body made of matter, the body that is naturally dead, becomes alive because of the presence of the soul. And when the soul lifts the body, the body made of dead matter becomes dead again. Now we can see in today's world especially, like there is a massive imbalance. The whole concern is about, about the materialistic aspect of our existence and rarely any consideration for the spiritual identity. Now there is a need to create a balance between these two. Now how do we create a balance? In simple words, I will define the difference between material and spiritual. Material nature is the world where we put ourselves in the center. And spiritual is the world where God is the center. That is the distance between material and spiritual reality. Just me and him. When I put me in the center, my family, my relatives, my friends, my possessions, these are all actually material. I mean, this is the very, very center of this material consideration is me and mine. Whereas when you, when you bring God in center, then it becomes spiritualized. It's not that we stop acting the way we are meant to act. Only thing is it's a matter of shifting our consciousness from me consciousness to God consciousness. An example for that I can cite, I presume all of you or most of you have read Mahabharat, most of you are acquainted with Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita in the battlefield, the battle is about to start between two, two uh, lines of the same family. Mm. Arjun or Pandavas and Durjadhan and his brothers Kauravas. Durjadhan is fighting the battle, Arjun is fighting the battle. Durjadhan is fighting the battle to regain his or retain his kingdom. Whereas Arjun, at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjun is reluctant to fight. He said, Arjun Krishna, I'm not going to fight this battle. What's the point in gaining a kingdom which is going to be stained with the bloods of my relatives? Rather, I'll become a mendicant and live by begging than try to win the, con the battle to regain my kingdom. But then Krishna starts to speak about Bhagavad Gita, imparts the knowledge. Then at the end, Krishna asks Arjun, now you decide what you want to do. And Arjun says, I will do whatever you are asking me to do. So here we can see Arjun is fighting the battle and Durjodhan is, the fight. Durjodhan is fighting the battle. For Durjodhan, is, is, it's a materialistic endeavor to win the battle. Whereas for Arjun, it is his service to Krishna. He didn't care about this kingdom. He's fighting the battle because Krishna wanted him to fight. So when we lead our lives with this consideration, acting for the sake of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supreme Proprietor, who is the Supreme Creator, who is the Supreme Maintainer, and at the same time, He's our dear most friend and Supreme Well-Wisher. He's our Father and He's our Supreme Well-Wisher. So, as I said, like, the balance has to be made between that. We, can't, we, we are not meant to give up our activities in this world. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying, no one can stay even for a moment without acting. 
न ही कश्चित क्षणमोपि जातु तिष्ठति अकर्मकृत अकर्मकृत मीन्स विदाउट एक्टिंग न ही कश्चित क्षणमोपि इवन फॉर अ मोमेंट वी आर फॉर वी आर एक्टिंग एट एवरी सिंगल मोमेंट एज लॉन्ग एज वी आर लाइव वी मे नॉट बी कॉन्शियस अबाउट एक्शन बट द बॉडी इज फंक्शनिंग द हार्ट इज पंपिंग ब्लड द लंग इज लंग्स आर ब्रीदिंग stomach is digesting all kinds of activities are going on so there is no consideration of not acting but the act in a proper way act with the understanding that he is the supreme controller and he is our supreme well wisher and we are doing everything for him if i have to maintain my family i do it with understanding that the family members are his children the people that i am supposed to take care of i take care of them because they are his children things that i do for the sake of spreading his glory and establishing his kingdom so that is the balance that comes to my mind when you speak about in pursuit of balance thank you very much maraj uh maraj i'm going to go a little personal I was reading your book Ocean of Mercy and uh, you mentioned something very interesting you said that um uh, you were searching spiritually and when you returned from Germany you searched for almost a year for a spiritual master or some guide and you clearly mentioned that you almost lost hope and gave up so if the calling was so deep why did you get so close to losing hope and and giving up that search i was in germany and it's there who, who when i actually became interested about indian spiritual culture and indian philosophy um it all happened one day we got into a very big argument with an american friend of mine <laughs> chuck hist and he was trying to kind of minimize india the poverty stricken country and so and so forth you know and naturally it hurt me and i just vehemently you know objected to that and and but later on i was wondering that i am trying to defend the glory of india but so little i knew about india actually I think most of you will agree that we grew up with the concept that west is the best. From a childhood we actually look up to the west. We don't really probe into our own culture so much. And that's what dawned in me at that time when I got into this argument with him and later on I was reflecting on that so little I knew about it. And that actually inspired me to start reading about Indian philosophy and indian spiritual culture and and as a result of that i became so inspired that i decided to go to india and pursue that spiritual life i knew by the time that if i wanted to pursue that course then i needed a teacher a guru and my feeling was as soon as soon as i came back to india i would find my guru and he would take me by my hand to mm, that journey and i landed in delhi i am from calcutta i didn't go back to my father's house in calcutta i went straight to rishikesh first actually uh haridwar and then to rishikesh and it was a little disappointing what i came across i mean i was thinking that all these people that were sadhus i was kind of meeting them speaking to them and feel that all they do from morning till night you know or may throughout the day and night practically just smoke hashish and like that is and i naturally was quite quite uh, disappointed because uh, in the west i had many friends who were into hashish and marijuana <laughs> <laughs> and and 
Uh, and I saw that, I could see that what they do, these drugs, they just make you, make you kind of dull. You become stupid actually. And uh, anyway, so then I started to go up the mountains, meeting people. Anyway, I met many nice people, no doubt about that, you know, many nice saintly spiritual personalities. But there was not this, this, this urge to surrender, because I knew that if I want to pursue spiritual life, I have to surrender myself to my guru. But I couldn't find anyone to whom I could actually surrender to. Something like I used to speak to them, but it didn't really appeal to me to that extent that I could actually surrender to them. And that's the time I actually felt that I have been searching for my guru, but I can't find him. If I really have a guru, then let him come and pick me up. So thinking that I went back to Calcutta and and it is at that time that uh, I actually, a friend of mine uh, took me to the temple in Calcutta and then I got this book called The Nectar of Devotion written by my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And as I started to read it, from the very first page it occurred to me that this is what I was looking for. Now naturally the question comes, you know, what appealed to me so much that I felt that way? Two things. I used to think that spiritual life means to aspire for liberation or emancipation. The perfection of spiritual pursuit is to achieve that liberation. And when I started to read, from the very first page it became clear, Prabhupada is mentioning there are five kinds of liberation. That really blew my mind. <laughs> like I was aspiring for liberation and he is speaking about five kinds of liberation. And then, to my utter dismay, <laughs> I realized that the liberation that I was pursuing, pursuing is the negative liberation out of that five. Out of this five, four are positive liberation and one is negative liberation. Trying to merge in the, the spiritual light called Brahma Jyoti. And then the next thing that occurred to me or kind of impressed me extremely uh, profoundly was Prabhupada is speaking about God is a person. God is a person and he is Krishna. And my feeling was, from my childhood I knew I was fond of Krishna, but I never ever it came to me with such clarity that he is the supreme personality of Godhead. And then that concept became even more clear when he pointed out that God is the supreme. Supreme means no one is equal to him and no one is superior to him. He is the supreme. Therefore, he is one. Hmm? No one is equal to him and no one is superior to him. He is the supreme. He is the supreme creator. He is the supreme maintainer. He is the supreme proprietor. And Although he is one without a second, he has many names according to his qualities and according to his activities called Leelas. Like his name is Krishna because in Sanskrit Krishna means all attractive. His name is Rama because he is the giver of the supreme pleasure, supreme joy. Ramate Iti Rama. He is Narayan because he is the shelter of all living entities. And it occurred, occurred to me that, I mean, in English also we have the same concept. God is omnipotent. He is omniscient. So these are the names of God. He is one without a second, but according to his qualities, 
he has his names. He is Krishna because he is all attractive. And then, anyway, I mean, that was kind of, you know, kind of made me realize that this is what I was looking for. Yeah. Maharaj, it's, uh, it was interesting. You were given the book, Nectar of Devotion. You read it. You were inspired. You were inspired to join the movement before you'd even met Srila Prabhupada. And in your very, very first meeting with him, he's given you this enormous task of translating his works. Were you at any stage during that time a little fearful that you've been given such a huge responsibility so early after joining this organization? Yeah, well, <laughs> when Prabhupada gave me that assignment, actually it happened in a train. <laughs> <laughs> I met Srila Prabhupada in Kumbh Mela in Ilabad. And then all of a sudden one day Prabhupada decided to leave because Kumumela was too noisy for him. So he decided to leave to, for Calcutta. And an arrangement was made for him to travel in a, in a carriage. A first class carriage was hooked into a Calcutta bound train. Because Ilhabad didn't have an airport. So Prabhupada was traveling with a small group of devotees. And fortunately I was in, included in that. And one of my senior god brothers, he, in the morning, he took me to Srila Prabhupada. And three of them, three other senior leaders were sitting on the bench seat facing Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was sitting on the other one. So Prabhupada asked me to sit next to him. <laughs> I said, no, Prabhupada, I would rather sit on the floor. Prabhupada said, no, you can sit here. So I sat down, and after some initial exchange, Srila Prabhupada asked me, so you translate my books into Bengali. And as you asked, yes, I naturally felt. In one hand, I was thrilled. Oh, he's giving me such a wonderful assignment. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, that feeling was there that will I be able to properly execute that mm, service? And I told him, Prabhupada, am I really capable of doing it? Prabhupada's response was, just do it. Practice makes a man perfect. That was his, his response to my fear. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, you found a guru. Is it important for everyone who wants to embark on a spiritual journey to have a guru? <clears throat> Can we get there without a guru? Not only in the spiritual quest or a spiritual journey, at every sphere of learning, we need a guru, we need a teacher. Guru means a teacher, actually. The Sanskrit expression for a teacher is guru. So, <clears throat> like, can anybody say that he learned the alphabet by himself or herself? We needed somebody to teach us, whether it was a mother or a teacher. I mean, even the alphabets, even to learn the alphabets, we need a guru. Even to learn the numbers, we need a guru. And then we grow up, we take up different lines of mm, subjects to study. We need the teachers. And the, what's the qualification of a teacher? Correct. That's my next question. Yeah. The qualification of a teacher is that he must be a master in the subject. He must know the subject himself thoroughly. Mm. Like, when we want to become a medic doctor, we study under qualified doctors, right? If he is not qualified doctor, he can't teach me how to be a doctor. And he teaches on the basis of books. Now these two things are essential, books and the teacher. Mm. So on the spiritual path, yes, as you're asking about the qualification. Well, first of all, yes. To, in our spiritual quest, in our spiritual pursuit, in our spiritual journey, we need a teacher, we need a guru. Mm. And <laughs> qualities, qualification, mm. like, and he should know the subject himself. And the subject is not a matter of speculation. The books are there, the books are called scriptures. 
does what is what is the meaning of scriptures scriptures are the books that reveal about the spiritual inf- that give us the information about the spiritual reality the books are there that speaks about spiritual reality and they are the scriptures mm. and the guru must be well conversant with the scriptures in order to impart or reveal the knowledge that is there in those scriptures maraj uh, so we found a guru and you mentioned the word spiritual reality a lot i read an article in the new york times that said 97% of the population identify themselves as spiritual and only 3% identify themselves as religious can you define for us what the difference between spirituality and religion actually is mm it's unfortunate that people are drifting away from religion and that's because what's going on in the name of religion today that any intelligent thoughtful person will become reluctant about religion mm. it's really unfortunate now as you asked what is the relationship between religion and spirituality religion actually is the means to understand the spiritual reality there is another reality beyond this reality mm-hmm. there is another reality beyond this material nature that's called the spiritual nature mm-hmm. we the spiritual beings the souls came from there souls are not product of some material combination of chemicals and so forth souls didn't evolve from matter soul came from another reality and that is the spiritual reality mm-hmm. and religion is the means by which we can actually understand the spiritual reality our spiritual identity what the spiritual world is like the nature of the spiritual reality and ultimately the source of all spiritual existence and material existence god mm. so religion is actually the means by which we can understand the spiritual reality just like physics is the means to understand energy mm. chemistry is the means to understand elements mathematics is the means to understand numbers similarly religion is the means through which we can understand the spiritual reality since physics is a science chemistry is a science mathematics is a science religion is a science but religion is not being treated like that anymore religion has degenerated into just some faith this is my faith that's your faith that's why your religion is different from mine and that's causing all these all these problems and atrocities in the name of religion mm. but it should if it is less consider if it's taken as a science a scientist from russia america england india china singapore they all can sit together and have a constructive discussion right similarly if religion is treated as a science then all the religious teachers and religious leaders from different groups different denominations from different religious sects can sit together and have a constructive discussion and therefore it is very important that it should be treated as a science not as a faith and i must admit that that was the key point of Shilo, of shila prabhupada's my spiritual master's teachings it's a science it's not just a faith and he used to say if you have any question ask there'll be an answer i don't want you to accept anything blindly if you have any doubt if you have any question you can ask and he did he did give answer to all the questions that's uh 
very profound, Maharaj. You know, as a sports scientist, we keep defining it as our role is not to ask questions, but to question the answers, which is a science of uh, digging deeper and deeper within. Maharaj, whilst you were a yogi, you've also been an entrepreneur where you have set up massive organizations, temples, all sorts of things. How have you managed to find that balance between spirituality whilst living in a capitalist world or a capitalist environment? How can we all navigate that challenge? Well, uh, to, uh, to do anything in this world, you need money. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, say, whatever, you know, I tried to do, you know, in most cases, I realized I needed money and uh, and it happened. I didn't have any personal funds. Like when I embarked in some projects, you know, people came forward to help me and took care of it. And the thing is that I just, I mean, whatever assignments I took upon myself, my consideration was that I am doing it to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I am doing it to benefit everyone becoming, by becoming related to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When you setting up an organization, Maharaj, and you need lots of money to, to build, and the money is not there, as someone who is surrendered, do you actually get scared or fearful? Or do you have this anxiety? No. No anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. If a servant knows that he has a very rich master, does he have to worry about where the fund is going to come from? No. And I tell you, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the way I approached every single project. And, and I never been uh, disappointed, you know, in my endeavor. Interesting. Maharaj, when you embark on a spiritual journey, you're trying to connect to a higher energy. And very often we talk of, you know, being attuned to that universe and being connected. How can someone, when you're hearing these voices, when you're hearing these gut instincts that are talking to you, uh, like you had a gut instinct to you know, trust Srila Prabhupada's message, when people have, how can you distinguish between whether that's just a conscious thought that's talking to you, or whether it's actually a higher energy that's speaking to you? I won't call it talking. I would ra rather put it as inner inspiration. Mm. Like sometimes the th you hear voices like in a dream, but in reality and you know, in most of the times, you know, when it comes to it, it is, I'll say, you know, a certain inspiration from within and just plunge into it and and it happens and so that becomes the proof that he really wanted me to do it <laughs> interesting so Maharaj when you surrender and you've been surrendered at the lotus feet of Krishna and Srila Prabhupada for almost 45 years do you still experience emotions like anger do you get angry at times and if you do what is your process of identifying it and getting through it Yes, I do angry. <laughs> I do get angry. But when I give vent to that anger, I try to do it with a smile. <laughs> Amazing. Someone told me that even anger is a good emotion if directed properly. That's true. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> like an example is Hanuman. You see, uh, when Hanuman first saw Ravan, his immense urge was to just, just smash him. 
but theory controlled his anger because that was when he was going to rescue sita or I mean, when he came to get the information about sita where she was because he felt there is a responsibility to go back and inform lord ramchandra but that was not the case with subhriv when the monkey regiment cross went across the ocean to sri lanka they went to trikuta mountain and from there just to observe the city of lanka from there and at that time ravan also came on the standing on the walking on the city wall to observe the monkey army and when sugriv saw that he jumped from trikuta mountain top to the wall and he just smacked ravan his crown went fi- flying <laughs> both of them started to fight mm. so yes in the service of the lord sometimes anger is necessary like when arjun was fighting the battle how can he fight a battle without getting angry but this anger is spiritualized because it is done for the sake of the lord mm. and but you know one has to be careful that it is properly done with the with the right objective and right purpose it shouldn't be done whimsically and it should be guided with the higher authorities like here krishna himself was guiding arjun mm. lord ramchandra was guiding the monkeys hanuman and subhriv and angad so yes anger can be used in the service of the lord but not for our own sake uh, that is not uh, desirable that anger for our own sense gratification or for our own fulfilling our own purpose or due to the frustration due to a disappointment in fulfilling our own purpose that anger is considered to be an enemy to our spiritual progress there are six enemies that are there in our hearts that stifle our spirit or obstruct our spiritual progress the lust greed anger illusion pride and envy mm. so yes mm. for our own sake we should not use anger but for the sake of serving the lord when it's necessary when it is directed by the lord or his bona fide agent yes then anger can be utilized but otherwise better not to better not hmm. marat speaking about these emotions like anger anything that's negative you know the world is going through so much of trauma and so much of trouble there are many people who are uh, suffering pain from emotional trauma from physical trauma being abused and they hold on to this pain for so long that it becomes an anchor for them their life just stops there and then how can people who are experiencing so much of pain who've gone through perhaps something really physical how can they use spirituality as a process of letting go of that pain so they can really achieve their fullest potential mm. well the first approach i should suggest is that to realize the fact that nothing happens by chance or accident behind every action there's a cause mm. and everything that happens to us is a result of our previous action in the past i mean we in this material nature we all are actually caught up with a with a network or with a system called karmic reaction as you so so shall you reap mm. if i am suffering then i have to realize that in somewhere in the past i have done something wrong i have inflicted pain to somebody else that is caused the rea- as a result of that action i am being subjected to the similar kind of pain that's one consideration the other consideration is the realization that this material nature is a place of suffering uh, this is just as 
No one goes to a prison to enjoy. We haven't come here to enjoy. This is not a place for enjoyment. This is, we are subjected to hmm, uh, suffering in a, because it's a place of suffering and this body is, an, is a wonderful instrument to receive pain. <laughs> Take any part of your body and consider in how many different ways you can inflict pain to this part, this part of the body. Take the earlobe. So insignificant, but consider in how many ways you can inflict pain to the earlobes. Now you consider in how many ways you can give pleasure to your earlobe. <laughs> and that actually applies to every single part of your body. Now you tell me, what does it indicate? This body is an instrument to receive pain. But we have been endowed with a faculty called intelligence. And with that we avoid the pain, try, try to avoid the painful situation. If I put my hand in, the, in fire, it'll, I'll get burnt. So intelligence says, don't put your hand in the fire. I am crossing the road, car is coming, intelligence says, don't cross the road now, let the car pass by. So this is how, you see, in, with our intelligence, we are tra av trying to avoid the painful situation. But eventually, you know, this is a place of suffering with a body that is meant to receive pain. And there are three kinds of threefold miseries are suffering. Suffering caused by our own body and mind. Suffering caused, suffering inflicted upon us by others. And suffering caused by natural calamities. And no one can actually avoid this threefold miserable situations. Everyone is subject to that. And there are fourfold suffering conditions, birth, death, old age, and disease. Mm. So everyone is subjected to that. No one can avoid it. Maharaj, what is, what is destiny and what is the role of it? Is if everything is preordained and is going to be happening in a certain format, where does one's intellect, will, determination come in, can destiny be changed or are we just working yes. to write that? Yeah. You see, the destiny is the course that is has been kind of designed due to my past karma, past actions. Mm -hmm. Generally, that is what destiny is. But we have been endowed with a faculty called will and intelligence. With these two things, we can change the course of our destiny. Like, if I understand that this is going to happen, and then natural consideration will be how to counteract that. I have the will to decide that. Mm -hmm. And I have the intelligence to determine that or design it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, um, you see, man it may be a product of his destiny, but he is not a puppet or a machine. He's a living entity. He has his free will to decide what he wants to do, and that can change the course of his destiny. Mm. Much for parents in the room who want to indoctrinate their children into a line of spirituality, what are the values or characteristics they should start developing their children? As our guest of honor said, values are taught at home. Yeah. You know, what are the values <clears throat> and how do we go about teaching these at home? In that respect, you know, for every single living entity, the mother is the first mother is the first guru. Mm -hmm. The mother is the first teacher. And then the father takes over. Until the age of six, it's the mother who should 
mold the child. I won't say train the child. I would rather say mold the child. And the principal molding factor is love. The more the love the mother gives to the child, the better a personality the child will become. It's the mother's love that builds the character of the offspring. And then the father, after, after six, is the father's responsibility, especially the boys. The girls remain under mother's care. But the father takes over the child and then he actually guides him. And who is the role model for the child? The first role model is his own father. He loves his father. He admires his father. He's proud of his father. No matter whoever the father is, the child is really proud of him. My father is the best personality. <laughs> so when the child is looking up to the father, father should also fit the bill. Like become the ideal personality that his father's child is looking up to him to be. So this is how I think the most important factor of the of training or grooming up or molding our children. And when they get the proper grounding, proper training at their childhood, that actually shapes up his future form. Mm. Maharaj, around the topic of balance, I just will ask you a few personal questions in terms of, in the last 45 years, what has been the one aspect of your personal growth and development that you are happiest or probably most proud of? Um, I was very fortunate to have the association of my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. Those days, Srila Prabhupada had about 10,000 disciples all over the world. And every one of them are dying to have just a few minutes of his association. I've seen devotees flying from America, Australia, Europe, just to have a moment's association of Srila Prabhupada. And at that time, when it was so rare to even have a moment's association of Srila Prabhupada, I had the good fortune of being with Srila Prabhupada practically 24 hours a day. And I must admit that I received a lot of affection from him and a lot of instructions from him and a lot of chastisement from him. <laughs> so, so these are the most wonderful phase of my life, I would say. Taking on from that, in the last 45 years, is there anything that you regret or you wish you could have done again? Yes. I wish I took this path right after my bath, right after my birth. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that I wasted so many years. But at the same time, actually, once I told Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I wish I could join you. Why didn't I come earlier? Prabhupada's response was, See, whatever happens to you in your life, you have to understand that it was designed to bring you to this point. And when I look back, you know, I can see that there had been many, many lamentable, you know, experiences in my life, many disappointments in my life. But today I can see that had those things not have happened the way they happened, I wouldn't have been here today. So, yeah, honestly, I'll say that you, I have nothing to regret. I don't want to. I feel that I have found the perfect path and perfect teacher to guide me on the path. And all I want is that life after life, I can stay on this path, serving my spiritual master. Maharaj, you told me once uh, a few years ago that education <coughs> is extremely important because Education together with the spiritual path tells the world that you're not taking spirituality because you're running away from reality. Because you can be successful in the material nature, in that material world, but you've chosen the path of spirituality. 
Well, it can be seen that way. I have, I have, I have experienced, I have seen people think that those who take to spiritual life, they are actually escaping, they are escapists. They failed in their materialistic endeavors, therefore they took to spiritual life. I will say even if that may be the cause, even then it is all right, it's perfect. Because whatever brings you to the right track, you have to consider that everything that happened was to bring you to that right track. Like, yes, somebody uh, may have been a failure materially or good for nothing materially and so forth. But ultimately it doesn't matter as long as you come to the spiritual platform. Because that is the ultimate goal of our existence. We get the human form of life to come to that platform. Like Vedas, one of the first instructions of the Vedas is Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Now that you got the human form of life, inquire about the spiritual reality. Otherwise, Ahara Nidra Bhaya Maithunancha Samanveta Pashubhi Samana. The life that is centered around eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, even the animals are leading that life. Centered around eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Are the human beings meant to lead their lives with just those propensities, centered around those propensities? No. Human life has been meant for, designed for something, to achieve some higher purpose. And that purpose is to recognize his actual identity. Only the human beings can question, who am I? An animal cannot question, who am I? An animal doesn't question whether God is there. An animal doesn't try to find out who God is and how he can establish his relationship with him. Only the human beings can. Therefore, the human beings have been endowed with a very advanced intelligence. And not only an advanced intelligence, human beings have been endowed with an ability to expand his consciousness. It's very, very nice actually. You know, according to the Vedic definition, there are five types of five levels of consciousness. Mm. One is covered consciousness. The trees and plants fall in that category. They are conscious, but you can see that their consciousness is practically covered. Then insects to the animals, mm, they fall in a category called shrunken consciousness. They're conscious, it's quite apparent that they're conscious, but their consciousness is in a shrunken state. The third level is the human consciousness, which is considered to be bud state of consciousness. Apparently a bud is also in a shrunken state. Its petals are in a shrunken state. But the buds has the ability, the buds have the ability to bloom into a flower. Mm. that the human beings have. Just like a bud blooms into a flower when it is, it is exposed to the light of the sun under the protection of the water. Mm. So similarly, the human beings, when they become exposed to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is compared to sun in this respect, and the shelter of a qualified, bona fide spiritual master, then his consciousness begins to bloom. That's the fourth stage of consciousness called the blooming stage, blooming state of consciousness. And then finally, it's a fully bloomed state of consciousness when he is completely spiritually enlightened, recognizing the Lord and his relationship with him. That is the fully bloomed state of consciousness. Now see, on, see the, the special prerogative of human beings. 
he has the ability not only he has a, a, a advanced and developed very developed intelligence but he has the ability to expand his consciousness to become fully spiritually conscious mm -hmm. that is the faculty of human life and that's why this opportunity must be properly utilized maraj in pursuit of balance moving ahead what is the one aspect that you would personally like to work on for yourself like understand the purpose of our existence mm. when you understand the purpose of existence the balance is automatically set automatically there you know the fine you see in simple words i would say <clears throat> spiritual life doesn't mean running away from the material life materialistic life <clears throat> rather to find a perfect harmony between spiritual life and material like materialistic activities like for example as you said like i took to spiritual life and you know yes i had been building temples and i had been translating books i had been uh making movies <laughs> i actually as you know like i made a uh tv serial on shri lopez's life which was telecasted in doordarshan indian national tv channel and uh I mean it's not that we are running away we are very much involved in like you know the only thing is that you know we are doing it for krishna i'm doing it for krishna i am doing it as a service to my spiritual master and there is nothing for my sake and that is what is actually making the perfect balance like and and that balance actually frees you completely from any anxiety as i said like can the servant of a very wealthy master have any anxiety when he is serving the master so similarly when what to speak of when you are serving the richest master that one can ever think of who owns everything who controls everything who created everything when you are serving him why there should be any anxiety there may be failure so when there is a failure then you consider that well my master doesn't want it that's why it didn't happen i cooked a very nice preparation for my master the master says that today i'm not feeling hungry <laughs> <laughs> so does the servant feel bad about it no you know it's like similarly we are involved in activities you know like apparently materialistic activities we are not running away from this world we are very much involved as you yourself said we wake up 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> sometimes you wake up even be much before that <laughs> at 3 o'clock i sent you a message this yes, morning <laughs> you did <laughs> i woke up at 2 o'clock <laughs> so you know this is our life i mean we are we are working pretty hard i think you know and we are dealing with money we are dealing with uh, you know all kinds of uh, situations and but the only difference is that i am not doing it for my personal benefit personal gain or personal aggrandizement i am doing it to serve my lord and master maraj um you're truly an inspiration and i can't thank you enough for the knowledge for the information for the guidance that you've given everyone um after many years i can honestly and sincerely say that the world needs many more of you and we pray that you are there to guide us for much longer thank you very much thank you thank you so much